the CATIA model. And if you click the CATIA node, there's a lot of options that relate to how Mode Frontier will handle the CATIA file. The top is the name of the module, uh, the node, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the first thing you want to do is open the document. So you find your CATIA document that you saved. Open it here. Um, you don't have to worry about any of these things for now. The only thing you want to do is, because it's going to be running um, all these experiments uh, automatically, you want to have some kind of easy way of finding the test that you want. Uh, so we're going to capture a screenshot of each test in a JPEG file, and that will go into your computer. Okay. So the next thing you want to do is connect uh, the inputs and the outputs you set up in the workflow to actual input and output parameters in your CATIA model. In order to do that, you hit these binoculars. And what it's going to do first is it's going to do this introspection, which is basically testing to make sure it can talk to the CATIA model and get uh, the different parameters in the model so you can work with them. So that usually takes about a minute. Uh, exit value zero means it's connected and everything is fine. And it'll actually pop up a window that has your whole model in here. And you can pick any of these parameters and tie them into parameters within the mode frontier workflow. So here, core width, we want to connect to the width. Double click it, it has a check mark, and it displays it up here. So again, the value of naming all your things is that now you can see, okay, core width relates to width, and you know everything's fine. Floor offset, again, is offset. And overhang ratio is overhang. And now you want to do the same thing for the outputs. Area core becomes area core. Area floor becomes area floor. And area footprint is area footprint. Okay. So that should do it for Katia. The X goes away. And the very last thing we want to do is set up the scheduler. And this is where the genetic algorithm actually happens. It's in two parts. There's a DOE, which is the original population. And then there's uh, the scheduler, which will set up subsequent generations. So first we click on DOE. We can specify uh, a lot of different ways to set up the initial population. Usually you'll pick random. And you want to set how many initial designs you want to create. And these will be created at random. So basically it's going to take all the ranges you set up for the inputs. It's going to create 20 random models. And then it's going to work those through its algorithm. So here we can set 20. You can change it to whatever. Uh, and add DOE sequence. And these are your 20 original population of 20 models. And you can see these are the inputs it's going to put into the model. So here we can click OK. Uh, and the last thing is the scheduler. This is the actual algorithm that's going to use. And most Frontier comes with a large variety of different algorithms and optimizers. Uh, at first, um, you can explore a lot of these. Um, they do different things and work with that in different ways. The typical genetic algorithm we're going to use is MOGA2. And here in its options, you can specify uh, everything that's controlling the algorithm. Um, number of generations. Uh, this is how many times it's going to run through. So you take basically your initial population, which was 20, and it's going to have this many generations. So if you have five here, you're going to end up with 100 models in the end. So maybe we set that to 10. And then here you can specify crossover, selection, mutation. And you can tweak these later uh, to get the genetic al algorithm working the way you want. So we set here 10, and that's OK. And that is basically the setup, the basic setup of a mode frontier workflow. So the next thing, uh, once that's all set up, uh, everything's green, there's no arrows, uh, we can hit the run button. And here it's going to ask you to save your file. And it's also going to, um, that's going to specify what folder it goes into. So here I'll just call it. Um, Mode Frontier 1, hit OK, and it's going to actually start running your experiment. And you can see the progress in the, OK, just have to wait a second. Is it freeze? 
Okay. So the experiment started um, here in the process log. You can see uh, the ID of the experiment. Um, this is the design number that's on. So right now it's just starting. Um, and it's done the first one, and now it's on the second one. And this window uh, provides a really good database. Um, you can check a lot of the progress as it's going. Um, this will basically tell you again uh, the name of the project, uh, all the data of how it's doing the algorithm, and in here it'll have your design sets. So here it's doing the first group. If you click on that, it'll actually go through each design, tell you that it started, tell you when it's complete, and actually tell you how long each design took. And this becomes really crucial as the um, models get uh, more complex because you can see here it, the design took 13 seconds. So if we have 400 models, you can you can uh, predict very easily easily how long your experiment will take. And if this is getting up to like 10 minutes, you know it'll, it's going to take hours to just do a few. So you have to keep an eye on this elapsed time. You can also go into each design. If you click on the design, it's complete. If you go into design data, it'll tell you um, everything about this, this specific test. Um, it'll tell you the input values. It'll tell you the outputs it got. And then this kind of lets you go back afterwards in your T model. And if you want to recreate this experiment, you can enter these input values and you'll get the same outputs back. OK, so as that's running, I'm going to show you how Mode Frontier manages its file structure. It's um, a little bit complex and very awkward, but you'll be able to find kind of all your experiment data in these file structures. So for each experiment, like I said, uh, Mode Frontier will create a folder. So here we created uh, Mode Frontier 1. And I'll tell you the first, I think the first um, idea of the first experiment. So in that folder, um, there's a few folders. You go into process. It'll tell you design groups. If you have more than 1,000 uh, tests, it'll, it's going to create a group for each 1,000. So here's the first one. Uh, again, you can go into process. And in here, you see a folder for each of your tests. And as the experiment's running, you can see it's adding folders. So right now, it's done 12 tests. And if you go into these folders, Again, you hit process, the TIA, process, and this will be kind of what you want to get to. These are your files. This is a script file that uh, is basically a TIA script that will input those inputs that Node Frontier used. So what you can do after the test is run, if you just open your TIA file, you can double hit the script and it'll recreate that experiment for you in TIA. And then this is the JPEG image screen capture that we saved out. You can click it. And this will give you an image of what the model looked like. Uh, so obviously, you don't want to, if you want to see like um, a slideshow of all of this, all of the tests, you don't want to go into each folder and get these JPEGs out. So a really good trick to get all your JPEGs at once. If you go into Windows uh, search, you can do a files and folder search. Uh, you can browse uh, to the specific uh, folder where all your experiments are in. And even though it's like this complex folder structure, you can have it find uh, just all the JPEGs that are in that folder, which will kind of pull out all your pictures uh, in order. So you, for that, you just hit asterisk.jpg and hit search, and it'll find all your experiments. And now you can kind of cycle through and see how the experiment has been progressing. This is a good way to kind of monitor your experiments. So you don't waste a few hours on one if you kind of see that it's not really generating the range uh, that you were looking for or the kind of behavior that you're looking for, you can restart the experiment. And you can also then uh, put these as frames into something like After Effects and create videos of the experiment and a lot of other things. So um, we're not going to finish. Um, this whole experiment. I'm going to stop this and then I'm going to show you some of the ways to visualize your experiments with data I've already created.